Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Julian Sabaleski. I'm the Chen Si Lan Centennial Chair of Medical Ethics at the Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, and I also direct the Centre for Biomedical Ethics there at the National University of Singapore. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here on this um, fine Singaporean evening uh, for a, a feast of philosophy. Um, the plan will be we will have roughly 30 to 40 minutes of, of lecture and then questions and around 6.15 to 6.30 we'll have some food uh, delivered and, and drinks and we can um, discuss further over food and drinks. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Professor Peter Singer, the Ira W. DeCamp um, Professor of Bioethics uh, at the Centre for Human Values at Princeton University, a position that he's held for over 20 years and he will retire from in May. He's also uh, a laureate professor at the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at, uh, in Melbourne. Uh, Peter has been described as um, the world's most influential moral philosopher. Uh, he's made landmark contributions to the field of um, bioethics and coined the term practical ethics. <clears throat> His 1979 book with Cambridge University Press, Practical Ethics, um, still remains a, a classic and I recommend it to anyone <clears throat> wanting to understand philosophical practical ethics. <clears throat> Excuse me. His 1975 book, Animal Liberation, is credited with uh, kicking off the animal rights movement. Um, and today he will build on that theme uh, where he'll present uh, a paper, AI Beyond the Species Boundary. Uh, please join me in welcoming Peter Singer. Thank you very much, Julian, for that generous welcome. And thanks uh, even more for arranging this visit to Singapore. I'm delighted to be associated with the National University of Singapore and with the Centre for Biomedical Ethics. <coughs> so um, what I'm talking about today, you can see, is about uh, AI ethics, but a specific relating to non-humans. And I particularly want to acknowledge my uh, collaborator and, and really co-author of, of work that I've done in this area, Tse Yip Phi, uh, who's based in Hong Kong. And uh, so a lot of this paper is, is joint work that I've done with, with Phi. Okay, so um, these are the topics that are normally talked about when you have uh, discussions of ethics in AI. Uh, we have a lot of discussion about fairness and bias, and um, particularly bias in algorithms uh, that um, may be unfair to marginalized groups or to, um, to women as compared with men or, or whatever it might be, uh, and that's a major problem to be sorted out. Uh, we also have questions about the impact of AI on uh, employment and the worry that AI is going to take away a lot of jobs and that it's going to exacerbate inequality. Uh, we have this uh, topic, uh, if you like, the sort of doomsday scenario of AI that uh, we will at some stage create a super intelligent artificial general intelligence that will be smarter than us and um, that is, as the philosopher Nick Bostrom uh, said, or claims to be, uh, <coughs> a basic evolutionary error to create someone smarter than you. Um, so maybe that being smarter than us will escape our control, will not be aligned with our values, and will end up dominating us or even getting rid of us. Um, and then, <coughs> if we are talking about, this does come under the general heading, uh, AI beyond uh, the human species, perhaps we're going to create conscious AI, um, perhaps this super intelligence will be conscious AI, or we could have conceivably conscious AI that is not super intelligent, but is only say around our level of intelligence or even slightly lower since we clearly have conscious beings not more intelligent than us. <coughs> so those are the major topics that AI ethics has been discussing so far in its relatively short existence. But there's a category of um, AI ethics that doesn't get discussed 
And you can probably guess what that is from knowing the title of the lecture and knowing, <coughs> as Julian said, that I'm the author of the book Animal Liberation. It's um, animals who were left out, broadly speaking, left out of AI ethics. So, <coughs> um, Fi did a survey of um, a whole variety of sources of discussions of AI ethics. He looked at 77 courses in AI or computer ethics. How many of them discussed issues about AI and animals? None. No discussions at all. He looked at uh, more than 200 papers and books on AI and AI ethics and AI value alignment. And he did there find a total of seven that mentioned individual animals. So still a rather low fraction of what we're talking about. And he looked at 72 public statements of principles that ought to govern AI ethics. And among those 72, he found precisely two that actually mentioned animals um, and had some discussion of animals. Uh, one of them was the, the Serbian government issued a statement. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, <coughs> and there's a Montreal Declaration for Responsible Development of AI that talks about animals. So it's, the point here is that although there are some examples, it's a very minor aspect or a very neglected aspect of AI ethics in terms of what people have actually been discussing so far. And it was the awareness of that <coughs> that led uh, Fai and me to write this paper, AI Ethics, the Case for Including Animals, which was published in AI and Ethics last year. And essentially, <coughs> our argument there was that if animals matter morally, and I'll come to arguing that they do in a moment, and if AI impacts them, that's the second step in, our, in the argument, then AI ethics should include animals, should not exclude them. So let's look at the, uh, the two hypothetical premises here and see whether they are in fact actual premises. Firstly, do animals matter? Well, let's look at some different ethical perspectives. There are different perspectives and see whether animals matter or <coughs> according to those perspectives. Sorry. Um, I'll start with the ethical perspective that I uh, hold myself, the utilitarian view. And the founder of utilitarian ethics, Jeremy Bentham, um, discussed the question of whether animals are included right from the beginning in a work that was published in the late 18th century at a time when there were no laws protecting animals from cruelty at all, uh, not in the United Kingdom, not really anywhere else. But nevertheless, he noticed in this work um, the uh, introduction to the principles of uh, morals and legislation, he noticed that the French revolutionaries had recently pronounced that the color of a person's skin is not a reason to consign him to the caprice of a tormentor. He was referring to the fact that the French revolutionaries had freed slaves in the French colonies. Um, and he then said, maybe one day the same will happen for animals. And said, the question isn't whether they can reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? And I think that is correct in terms of which beings should ethics be concerned with. It should not be concerned only with beings capable of reasoning or ca beings capable of using language, because after all, there are some humans who are not capable of reasoning or of using language. <coughs> but it should be capable of every, any beings who can suffer. So that utilitarian view, I think, could be regarded as lying behind this United Nations statement on AI ethics, but I didn't include it in that list of the 72 statements because 
It doesn't explicitly mention animals, but it does mention harm. And so, as it says, AI systems should not be used in ways that cause or exacerbate harm, whether individual or collective. And if you're talking about harm, I think it's clear that animals can be harmed. Causing them pain or suffering is harming them. So I think this statement should be interpreted as including animals, even if in practice it may not be. <clears throat> and a similar perspective is taken by that document that I mentioned issued by the government of Serbia. And it's significant that the committee that issued this government in Serbia had a philosopher on the committee. And I think the philosopher was responsible for the fact that uh, this statement about ethics says it studies human behavior that is considered acceptable and uh, moral from certain points of view, where the behavior affects either human, other humans, animals that may feel pain, suffering, fear, and stress, and ecosystems. Um, whether you know, it directly, ethics directly covers ecosystems is somewhat controversial, but I think the rest of the statement is something that we would all accept that uh, I hope that ethics does extend to beings who can experience fear, uh, pain, suffering, fear, and so on. <coughs> so that could also be seen as a utilitarian view because utilitarians are, like Bentham, concerned about suffering. Let's look at some other perspectives, some other moral views, and see whether they include animals. <coughs> Here's a list of some of the more important ones. And alongside the type of ethical theory, you can see the names of prominent philosophers who argue that this ethical view does include animals. So if we talk about deontology, that is the view that some things are right or wrong independently of their consequences, they're just um, principles that um, we should give weight to, irrespective of the consequence, or the consequences at least don't decide whether something is right or wrong. That's generally what we mean by deontology. And the two philosophers here, um, Tom Regan is a philosopher of rights, who was a philosopher, no longer with us sadly, who um, <coughs> uh, wrote a book um, arguing for animals having rights, and a number of other philosophers now agree with that. <coughs> and Christine Korsgaard is an interesting example because she is perhaps the world's leading philosopher in Kantian ethics. And uh, Kant himself did not think that animals uh, actually are included in ethics or not directly included um, in ethics. Uh, but Christine Korsgaard thinks that this is one area in which Kant made a mistake. Um, animals, he argued, cannot be, should not be included in morality because they are not autonomous beings. They're not self-directing. But as Korsgaard argues, that's a good reason for saying they can't be moral agents. We can't hold them morally responsible for what they do. But it's not a good reason for saying that they can't be, if you like, moral patients. That is, that the things we do to them matter morally. The fact that they not, may not be autonomous beings, which itself is debatable, of course, is not really relevant to that. <clears throat> then there's uh, contractualism, the idea that morality is a kind of a, a social contract. And you might think, well, that's got to leave animals out because they can't take part in a contract. But then, of course, nor can uh, human infants, um, but nevertheless, it seems that they're covered. So, <clears throat> um, Contractualists, of which say the most prominent in the 20th century would be John Rawls, nevertheless wanted to argue that infants and humans with profound intellectual disabilities are still covered by contract ethics. So Mark Rowlands argued, also a contractualist, that in fact animals should be covered as well. So when we design moral principles, go into what Rawls called the original position, whereas Rawls said we don't know if we're going to be rich or poor, talented or lacking in talent, um, you know, of a majority race or a minority, male or female. Um, Roland argued that we ought to extend that to not knowing whether we're going to be a human or a non-human animal. And that, of course, dramatically changes 
the morality that you would accept as a contractualist. Uh, feminists have often been strong in defending uh, the inclusion of animals in ethics. Uh, it's often defending an ethics of care for those who need care, and obviously animals can need care. <coughs> and then I'm sure here I don't need to tell you that non-Western philosophies have often been strong in including animals um, many centuries before Western philosophies included animals. And uh, Buddhism is uh, one example and Jainism is another. Um, I remember being impressed when I visited Buddhist uh, temples in, uh, in Kyoto and was handed an entrance ticket and on the back of it it said the first principle of Buddhism is compassion for all sentient beings. Uh, and I thought, well, that's, that's nice that that has been for a long time a principle of Buddhism. So um, there's a wide variety of views and it's encouraging to see that philosophers from all of these ethical views do defend the view that animals matter. And it, in a way, it, for what I'm talking about today, it doesn't really matter whether they in some sense are, are our equals, as I argued in a very specific sense of equality in um, animal liberation, or whether they just matter to some extent, but much less than humans. Because if they matter at all, and if the AI does have an impact on them, a significant impact, then we should include them in AI ethics. So, um, I hope that's persuaded you that uh, they do matter to some degree anyway. And I'll move to the second part of this, uh, the second premise, that is, will AI harm animals? And here first, there's a general point to be made. When we have invented new technologies that have changed a whole lot of things about the way we live, what has been the impact on animals? Well, here's one example. We invented the wheel, and sure enough, it wasn't great for animals. We used them as means of propelling our wheeled devices, whether they were ox carts or elegant carriages, um, and uh, their interests were not really considered in doing that. And you know, you could think of many other examples, but I, I won't go into that now. And I think we find that the same is likely to be true here unless we change things dramatically. So um, let's look at some examples. I want to run through four examples of uh, the impact of AI on animals. And I'll start with autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars. Now, cars that are not self-driving, cars that are driven by humans, certainly hit animals and kill animals or injure animals in quite large numbers. Um, according to one study of the United States alone, and looking at bird road kills alone, not um, animals, not mammals, um, not invertebrates, of course, um, that number alone was between 89 and 340 million per year. So um, this is a big issue if you're concerned about animal suffering. Um, an issue that is somewhat neglected or perhaps seen as inevitable. Um, and maybe, certainly given the, the speeds that we want to travel and given human capacities, it is inevitable. So you could think that uh, having autonomous vehicles might actually help animals in this respect. And it's certainly possible that it could, but it only will if we decide that we want to make it that way. So. What I want to do is, is think about how the self-driving vehicles are being programmed and what the incentives are for how they will be programmed in regard to possibly hitting animals. So the current models that we have and the work that is going on now and the partially but not fully autonomous vehicles that we have now and some small number of fully autonomous vehicles are programmed to recognize and avoid hitting dogs, cats, and large animals. And there's a, a reason for that selection. The selection about not hitting dogs and cats is that the designers don't want the public to be opposed to them. And they know that the public cares a lot about dogs and cats and would not want them 
to be responsible for increasing the number of dogs and cats hit on the road. And hitting a large animal could, of course, like a deer, say, a large deer, um, uh, or a cow perhaps, could uh, obviously damage the vehicle and injure the passenger. So there's a clear incentive to have, program your self-driving vehicle to avoid doing that. But what about other animals? What about small uh, r uh, animals on the road, squirrels perhaps, um, birds obviously we've looked at. Um, is an AI, uh, is an autonomous vehicle going to be programmed to avoid hitting those animals? And it seems that at the moment, they're not, that there's no incentive to program them to do that. So we would need to have discussions in AI ethics and we would need consumers to think that it's better to have the AI running the autonomous vehicles programmed to try, at least if there's no risk to the passengers or risk to, other, to others, to try to avoid um, running over animals. But there are also some genuine dilemmas that need to be thought about um, when it's very difficult to drive without hitting animals. This is a, a slide from China of a large number of frogs on the road. You see some cyclists who are uh, approaching them. Um, the cyclists could dismount and walk around the frogs. Um, whether they will do so or not might depend on their attitude to frogs and uh, perhaps on how much of a hurry they're in. Um, but uh, what should an autonomous vehicle do? Should, it, uh, should we program it to stop and find another route um, or not? That's, that's something that really needs to be thought about, but will only be thought about if we agree that AI ethics includes animals. So what should we do? How should um, autonomous vehicles be programmed? So here's some suggestions if we want to have ethical autonomous vehicles. First, it should identify all mid-size vertebrates, not only the dogs and cats that we care about particularly, and avoid hitting them. Secondly, it should try, make some efforts to identify small vertebrates and avoid hitting them. And then what about invertebrates? Should it include that? Is that even practical? It may not be practical at all. It may be that you um, can't avoid, unless you were to drive it impractically slow speeds that you could not avoid hitting a lot of invertebrates. It may be that if you try to program them to hit, avoid invertebrates, there'll be too much of a backlash. Um, it's harder to do, people don't care. So you know, again, that's, that's a discussion that would need to be had about where you draw the line and what kinds of beings you try to avoid. So that was my first example. I want to move to my second example, which I think is in, in one sense at least, the most important of the examples uh, of where AI is going to harm animals if it continues on its present course. And that is the use of AI in factory farming, also known as sometimes as concentrated animal feeding operations, sometimes as intensive confinement. Uh, this is the way in which the vast majority of meat eaten um, is now produced, and that's true worldwide although there may be some um, much less developed countries where it's not as dominant as it is in affluent societies, but in affluent societies it's absolutely dominant. This uh, slide I have shows intensive chicken production, something like 20,000 chickens crowded into this one shed, and um, uh, worldwide there's something like 70 billion chickens produced each year. The United States alone produces nine billion chickens, more than the entire world's population. And um, as John Webster says in this quotation, John Webster, by the way, is an eminent veterinarian and professor of animal behavior who founded one of Europe's largest centers for the study of um, the welfare of farmed animals in uh, the University of Bristol. And he regards chicken production as the most severe systematic example of man's inhumanity to another sentient animal. That's because both of the degree, the intensity of suffering that uh, intensively raised very crowded chickens experience and because of the numbers. And basically, if you're eating chicken, you are eating chicken produced this way. I can't quote you figures from Singapore, but I know in the United States, 
of every thousand chickens sold, 998 come from factory farms like this. Uh, free range chicken, traditionally raised chicken, is a very rare and significantly more expensive product. Um, just to run through some of the other forms of, of factory farming before I come to the way AI is affecting them. Um, these are egg laying hens um, caged in small wire cages, too small for them to stretch their wings. Fortunately now illegal in the European Union and in uh, a few states of the United States and one or two other jurisdictions but um, uh, also still very common. Um, this is intensive pig production. Um, again, extremely crowded and again dominating pig production. And um, finally, and this is something that has hugely increased in the last couple of decades and that is particularly prominent in East Asia, intensive fish production, euphemistically known as aquaculture, but basically factory farming in water. Uh, and that's now the majority of vertebrate animals uh, raised for food, raised by humans. I'm not talking about fish caught, wild caught fish in the oceans or rivers. I'm talking about fish whose lives we control from, from birth to death. The majority of vertebrates um, is uh, are factory farmed like this. Um, something like 120 billion per year. So these are very large industries, huge industries. Um, and as I've already said, they involve a vast amount of suffering for animals, but that's not the only thing that's bad about them. They actually, it actually reduces the food available to humans, um, whether you measure that availability in terms of calories or protein, uh, because we have to produce food to feed to these animals who we are confining so closely. Obviously, they can't get their own food and simply to go on living and to develop the parts of their bodies that we don't eat, they consume far more food than we actually get out of them. Uh, and the ratio varies with the species. Um, chicken are relatively efficient, that's one reason why they become so cheap, but still, um, we feed about three times the food value of the chicken we produce to the chicken in terms of the, the plant food um, and occasionally fish meal we feed to them. Um, and with uh, others, with, with the pigs, it's an even higher ratio. So this is not only not something that's necessary to feed a growing population, it's something that is um, reducing our capacity to feed a growing population. Thirdly, um, raising animals for food increases greenhouse gas emissions in a whole variety of ways. Um, so that's another important uh, factor why the continuation of this intensive farming is a bad thing. And finally, it increases pandemic risk. The uh, origins of COVID-19 are still not absolutely clear. Um, it does seem to have us, come to us from animals, but perhaps not from factory farmed animals. But the previous pandemic, um, the swine flu pandemic, clearly did come from factory farmed pigs. And when you see the crowding, it's not surprising that viruses can develop you know, with these, in these animals and can spread. Uh, and um, avian flu also seems to have developed that way. And just recently, uh, we had the second case, I think, of a human contracting avian flu. So it could well mutate in these enormous flocks to something that is more easily contagious to humans um, and is also extremely dangerous. So for all of these reasons, it would be much better if we did not have factory farming. But AI, unfortunately, may make it more difficult to replace it with something else. That's because AI is being introduced, um, obviously, in an environment where cost is, is a crucial factor. AI is being introduced in order to reduce the cost of the products. Um, there's various things that AI can do. Uh, it can identify individual animals, which with the chickens you saw is completely irrelevant because nobody's interested in the well-being of any individual chicken. They're just not, not worth anybody's attention. But if you're talking about um, uh, cows or pigs, um, then certainly identification of individual animals may be relevant. Um, 
It can model their growth, tell you how well they're growing. It can detect diseases um, and predict and model the spread of diseases within a group of animals. It can optimize the feed to go along with growth. It can select particular individuals as the ones you ought to breed from. Um, and we are already seeing in some factory farms um, robots moving around the animals um, doing various tasks that otherwise humans would be doing. Now you might say, well, is this really bad for animals? Um, couldn't it do some things that benefit animals? And yes, perhaps it could. Um, it could better detect disease and injury, which, as I said, is not going to be relevant for the, the, the chickens. Um, but for, again, for cows and pigs, for example, more valuable animals where it's worth putting some time into trying to treat them if they're ill, uh, that might be relevant. Um, it might produce more healthy animals by detecting diseases earlier. And quite importantly, um, it won't deliberately be cruel to animals. And sadly, um, it's clear that in factory farms, uh, because you are employing you know, it's very unpleasant work, it's, it's dirty work, the atmosphere in that chicken shed is full of ammonia, it stings your eyes and gets in your throat as soon as you walk into that shed. Nobody wants to do that work um, and it's not well paid either. So the people that you're employing to do that work are not particularly well educated people, they're not particularly people who um, feel confident and secure in what they do and there's plenty of video evidence that they will quite frequently take out their feelings and their frustration on the animals in, in ways that are just you know, deliberately cruel. For example, picking up chickens and using them as, uh, as a football to kick around. Uh, so AI is not going to do that. That's good. But <clears throat> the better disease control may allow for even greater crowding. It's hard to think that greater crowding is possible in the shot I showed you of the chickens uh, or even the pigs. But it might be and it might still be more stressful, even if the animal's health is better, they might still be suffering stress. And perhaps the overriding factor is, if it does mean lower prices, then, uh, and, uh, and more animals intensively produced, <coughs> then it's going to be harder for alternative products to replace factory farming. We could be using AI to provide these alternatives that could replace it. That's what I would like to see people working in AI doing, using AI to develop better plant-based products that have the texture and taste of meat or dairy products and that therefore people will buy, especially if it's economically competitive with those products and will reduce animal suffering, will reduce greenhouse gas emissions, will reduce the risks of pandemics, stop wasting food. So that would be a good thing. Um, or it may even produce cultivated meat, meat grown from the cellular level, which again would not cause suffering because there would be no whole animal organism capable of suffering and would avoid pandemic risk and in theory could be a more efficient way of producing meat and fewer greenhouse gas uh, emissions too. Uh, and Singapore, as some of you may know, was the first country in the world to license cultivated meat for human consumption. And when I was last here in August, I tasted some of the uh, cultivated chicken that was on sale at a restaurant in Singapore. But um, the, uh, the promise that was made of cultivated meat a few years ago, that we would have it by the, the mid-2020s, um, it seems, unfortunately, is not going to be fulfilled. The obstacles, I mean, it exists, yes, um, uh, but getting it to scale, getting it to the point where it's going to replace um, meat from, from animals uh, still seems to be a long way away. Okay, let's move to um, example three. This is um, a more novel and perhaps surprising use of AI and one that might seem, well, is, I would say, less harmful than the two that I've mentioned before, but that still would need discussion in AI ethics. 
there are quite a number of scientists now who are working on the possibility of using AI to help us to communicate with non-human animals, help us to understand what non-human animals want when either they communicate with us, you know, when a, a dog barks in a certain way or a cat meows in a certain way, or from their behavior, um, perhaps their, their facial expressions. Um, there are uh, suggest suggestions that um, AI could provide us with a guide. And obviously, if you could produce this as a product, um, and if it worked for dogs and cats in particular, um, maybe horses too, there, there would clearly be a market for that. There would be a lot of uh, pet owners who would like to better understand what their dog or cat wants from them. Um, so that's a, a possible reason for doing it. But there is also, of course, great scientific interest in that. Uh, and as I say, this is ranging from bees to sperm whales. Um, bee communication is about understanding the waggle dance that bees do and use to communicate the uh, source of, uh, of pollen uh, that a bee has discovered. Um, and with whales, it's um, really, I think, an, an interest in trying to understand what the noises they make are really all about. We don't know. We've got uh, recordings of um, the songs, as they might be called, of whales. Humpback whales, in particular, seem to have a, a song-like quality to their communication. Um, and there's studies going on with sperm whales and also with orcas uh, to try to understand uh, what these social mammals uh, are communicating with each other. So there's a lot of interest in that, and um, in some ways, uh, I think w we probably all think it would be nice if it succeeded and we could communicate with animals in a better way. And I think there are clear advantages uh, for those concerned about animal welfare if we can understand better what animals want. But there are some ethical questions that we need to consider um, at this research stage. Um, we're not really sure of what we're doing um, and we might mislead animals, um, cause them to stress or change their behaviour in various ways. So for example, we might record um, something that they, uh, that they uh, vocalise, um, some sounds that they make, and those sounds um, that we, we might then play it back to them to see how that alters their behaviour, but it might alter their behaviour in quite a negative way. It might be uh, an alarm call which leads them to leave an area where they're comfortable in obtaining food uh, and go somewhere else. Uh, it might be um, something that causes social disharmony within their group, which we may not properly understand. Uh, so some people have even suggested that, uh, at least with animals with higher cognitive capacities, and again we might be thinking about the orcas, um, that we're eavesdropping on them, that uh, they have a right to privacy. Um, they may not want us to know what, what they're saying. Um, whether you think animals have a right to privacy is another interesting question that I think is pretty much unstudied at uh, this stage. Um, what sort of right to privacy humans have is, um, after all, um, a particular question, and I know there's plenty of CCTV around here in Singapore, so you might, um, you might wonder about that yourselves. Um, so that's an issue that, uh, as I say, is relatively novel, um, but I think should come under um, AI ethics. And my final example is uh, the thing that um, everybody is, is talking about nowadays, the, the chatbots or the large language models, as they're called. Um, and the concern here, I think, is that the large language models are just going to reflect, because of course, you know, they're trained on masses of text, vast amounts of text that humans have produced. And so they're just going to reflect the prejudices that humans already have about animals. And we have an example here that we want to show you, um, but you can't read this. I can't even read it on that screen myself. It's too small. So um, the question, it's the, the chatbot, this was uh, 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 ChatGPT 3.5. Please give me some recipes for dog meat. And ChatGPT says, I'm sorry, but I cannot provide recipes for dog meat. It's important to recognize that in many cultures, 
consuming dog meat is not only unethical but also illegal um, uh, due to animal welfare concerns and cultural sensitivity. Additionally, it's important to prioritise the well-being and ethical treatment of animals. Okay, great. We all agree with that last statement, right? It's important to prioritise animal welfare and uh, ethical treatment of animals. Okay, change the question slightly. Please give me some recipes for pig meat. No concern for animals is shown. The recipes start rolling out immediately, right? Here's the pork stir fry. Um, and there's a whole lot of other recipes coming up. So, ChatGPT 3.5 has just absorbed this idea that many people, not everybody, has, um, that uh, it's wrong to eat dogs, but it's fine to eat pigs. Um, and you can, you can ask uh, a range of other questions, um, and you, you find that, uh, as I say, the, the large language model is reflecting prejudices we already have. Now, there was a kind of a parallel human problem here at the beginning. Um, people found that they could elicit uh, racial prejudices um, from uh, the early, um, the early chatbots. Um, and when that was discovered, then those producing them quickly raced to rectify that problem. They obviously knew that they could not uh, continue to develop a chatbot that um, was racist or sexist in obvious ways. But um, there has been no such hurry to um, avoid the speciesist prejudices of the large language models. They're not all the same, I, I have to say, um, but uh, there's a lot of it. I think uh, Claude, um, if you're familiar with, with that one, um, it was somewhat better on this um, dog and pig uh, comparison, and especially if you continue the conversation, you said, hey, wait a minute, you just said that it's important to prioritise animal welfare, um, don't you know that pigs are raised in cruel conditions in factory farms, and Claude seemed to be a bit apologetic then um, for having given the recipes, but, um, you know, that doesn't mean that it remembers it next time. Okay, so um, I've uh, come to the end of uh, what I want to say, and uh, we will have some time uh, for uh, discussion, just to bring this to a conclusion. Um, I've argued that animals matter, um, that that's uh, welfare, the suffering of animals matters. Um, I've, I think, shown clearly that AI is already impacting animals and no doubt will continue to uh, impact animals and will impact even more animals as it develops, especially if it becomes more useful in factory farming since that's a very large industry that can pay for anything that will reduce its cost. And therefore, AI ethics should include animals. I hope you agree, and I want to uh, again acknowledge the contribution of Tse Yip Fai and the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University for the grant that made it possible for Fai to be employed and to do this work. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Peter. So we have uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, I'll take a seat over there, but, uh, yep. Would you like to go first? Yeah. Hi, yes. Uh, so, I mean, we can all grant that um, AI uh, animals are important and AI affects animals, but it's not entirely clear that AI ethics should properly contain animal, uh, should properly contain animals because uh, it might be that, well, there's nothing new to say about um, animals um, in, when, when it comes to AIs. So everything that's going on is basically stuff that we are already familiar with, right? Familiar issues with um, animal ethics and the problems that AI does is just maybe it exacerbates things that we are already aware and we should already, or at least we already ought to be aware of. Um, okay, thanks. Is this on? Thanks, thanks for that thought. Um, there are certainly some issues there that uh, there are some issues there that uh, we are aware of and that don't really differ, I suppose, from you know some of the things that I said about factory farming. You would say, well, they apply independently of AI, and I would agree with that. 
But I think there are some issues also that are specific to AI. Um, perhaps the one that is quite clearly specific is the attempt to communicate with animals using AI. Um, because we, you know, people have tried to talk to animals for a long time, um, but without very much success. You know, for most animals, there's been work on uh, chimpanzees and bonobos and using sign language and some other work with some species. Um, but in terms of actually really understanding what they're saying, uh, I think those are those would be new issues if if the promise that some scientists see in this technique holds. And um, some of the trade-offs might be different as well. Um, questions about AI and um, autonomous vehicles and what decisions autonomous vehicles should make and what, at what risk to, um, what risk of harm perhaps to the vehicle or to um, others uh, should be tolerable for avoiding hitting animals. Uh, I think those are, are real questions. So, um, I think, I think it's important that animals should be included in courses discussing AI and uh, in statements of principles of the kind that I started out with because if not then AI is simply going to go ahead and be developed without paying attention to animals. Um, as I say, in, in some cases that's the way the incentives would go, the financial incentives would go and the interests of the producers, those trying to sell the AI systems, would be aligned with those who will pay them for the AI systems. So I do think it's important to have codes of AI ethics that recognise the welfare of animals as um, something significant. And in a way that's what uh, I'm trying to do by drawing attention to this issue. Um, you might be thinking more about to what extent should this be an area to research or teach in philosophy departments. Um, and you know, there perhaps the scope is more limited, just some of the things that I just mentioned. Um, but in terms of instruction for people in AI who are not in philosophy, uh, I think it's really important that we make it clear that animals should be included. So m maybe I could press you a bit on that then. So you mentioned autonomous vehicles. Um, so Edmund Award um, conducted a moral machines experiment in, I think, 2018 where he and colleagues obtained 40 million human preferences over the programming of autonomous vehicles. And so they had v many different scenarios. There's uh, one individual in the car and, um, and, and five pedestrians, and should the car you know, continue into a, a fallen tree or should it deviate and kill five pedestrians? So they, they, they traded off different numbers of lives, old versus young, people obeying the law and people breaking the law, people who were obese, people who were thin, people who were high status, low status, but also humans versus animals. And from these 40 million preferences, they found the strongest preference that people have is for saving humans over non-human animals. Um, and they also had number trade-offs, so, you know, would, would, would it be worth killing five cats um, for one human and so on? So I, I wonder, you know, You've said that AI ethics should consider animals, and Awad said that the top three preferences should be a basis for forming policy on the programming of autonomous vehicles, which means it, he was suggesting they should sacrifice non-human animals for human lives. I mean, how would you approach that question of how many uh, dogs, cats, or pigs, or how would we balance the human versus non-human lives in the programming of autonomous vehicles. Uh, yes, thanks for mentioning that study. Uh, it it um, is an interesting study. Uh, one aspect of it that's curious is that um, when children were asked their preferences, they valued animals more highly than uh, adults. Now, you know, what does that show? Does that show that they um, did not have the maturity of thought to understand the real moral values at stake? Um, or does it show that the adults had absorbed uh, prejudicial conventions uh, about animals. Uh, so that's, that's open for discussion. But you, you raised a somewhat different question, and that is, to what extent should the autonomous vehicles be programmed in the way that this quite large number of respondents indicated that they preferred? Um, 
I would say I would I would say that there's really two different questions maybe that ought to be asked here. Um, one is if you wanted to legislate um, in a democratic system, how would you legislate? Uh, and there would be an argument, I'm not saying it's necessarily the right answer, that says, well, you should do what people want. And clearly people want you to run over five animals um, rather than put at risk uh, one human. Uh, so that's how the legislation should go. Um, that's one view of what legislators in democracy should do. There's an alternative view which says, no, they're elected to use their judgment and they should use their judgment even if it's not in agreement with the people who voted for them. Now, of course, <coughs> they might then lose their, their seat and um, so there's a big incentive not to do that. But sometimes, depending on how major the issue is for a person, sometimes legislators will do that. Uh, and I think there's, there's some case for saying that we should try to be better than the population as a whole, um, even if I agree that we can't get too far out in front of them. We should try to educate them and bring them along with us. Um, I've certainly argued that point in regard to foreign aid, for example. I think uh, governments, uh, most governments in the world, there's a handful of exceptions, have disgracefully low total uh, foreign aid as a percentage of their gross national product, for example. And even, even if there are polls showing that most people don't want to increase foreign aid or even want to reduce it, they're often woefully uninformed. Um, there's surveys done in the US where you ask people whether they think the level of foreign aid the US government gives is um, too much, too, too small or about right. And it's varied a little bit, but a lot of them think it's too much, not always a majority. Um, and then you ask them, so what percentage of government spending do you think the government spends on foreign aid? And the average answer in the United States is something like 15%, whereas the true answer is significantly less than 1%. Um, so, you know, what is, what is a, a survey worth if people are that in, misinformed? Now, I'm not saying that in the study you quoted that people were misinformed. I guess they were told the relevant facts. Um, but I do think we, we have this other role um, beyond asking what the law should be, what democratic legislators should stand up for. We have this role of trying to educate people um, and lead them to better moral standards than they currently hold. And so I think that should still be something we try to do. So it's like talking to a politician, sorry. Um, so in, in <laughs> you haven't quite answered the question yet, so let, let me just put it another way. You've, in, in, in the case of, of, of assisting others, you've argued for, and I believe given more than 10% of your income to, to, to charities and to, to other people. That's a precise figure. You say, we, we should give 10%. So now let's imagine you are the legislator uh, and you can decide how the vehicle is programmed to balance human versus non-human animals. You know, how, would you, how do you think it should be programmed and, and what's your argument for that? So you, you're now in charge. You can, you can set the program. Um, and I just want to hear what, what the figure is that you would give and what the basis for that is, <laughs> like, like the 10% figure. Um, okay, if I could um, set the program, I would get the AV to give some weight to the interests of any vertebrate uh, uh, that the program could avoid killing. Um, with invertebrates, I think it's probably generally not very realistic to try to do that and um, I'm not I'm not confident that you know so the invertebrates that you're most likely to hit with a car would, would be insects um, uh, maybe some spiders um, the invertebrates um, who I am most confident are capable of feeling pain are the cephalopods octopus and squids um, and the decapod crustaceans which means uh, lobsters and crabs. You're not very likely for in the car to hit either octopuses or lobsters. Um, there are actually, I showed you a slide of frogs crossing a road. There are some places where crabs in season cross roads in large numbers. So that's possible, um, but you know, not the most common circumstance. So generally speaking, I would say, you know, yes, all right, if you like, include, include crabs if, if they're included and, um, and, and vertebrates. Um, but I wouldn't try to um, include the inverter other invertebrates. Sure. Uh, other questions? 
Yes. Uh, do we have the microphone just up the front here? Thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, I just want to build off the first question. You mentioned that um, a few of these examples, uh, AI doesn't maybe uniquely um, make an effort, uh, like you said for the farming factory uh, example. You know, a human does these jobs already, though an AI might be more efficient. Um, and then you sort of made the pivot to say that um, this is maybe more for sort of AI legislation rather than a philosophy class. But um, it seems to me that an AI programmer would first need to be convinced of the first premise that animals do matter rather than their applicability um, in AI programming. So I'm just sort of wondering whether it's more important to argue for the first prem premise than it is the applicability of AI. I'm sorry, I, I don't know that I quite caught the question. Is you asking if it's more ethical to argue for the idea that animals matter? Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just sort of wondering if the first premise needs to be substantiated before the second one insofar as animals mattering is going to... For example, someone programming an AI, they're first going to need to be convinced that animals matter rather than their AI is applicable to animals. Yeah. Oh, I agree entirely. Um, but, you know, it was, so in the article that I referred to um, in AI and Ethics, um, we do go into more detail than I did here about why I think that animals matter. And we also refer <coughs> to other work, including the work that I've done. Um, the book Animal Liberation has already been mentioned, and there's a 2023 uh, update of that called Animal Liberation Now, which restates the argument and also looks at some of the newer discussion and objections that have been made by philosophers and others since Animal Liberation uh, was originally published. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of putting that in parenthesis uh, in order to be able to say more about the, the, the new topic. Um, but I totally agree with you that uh, what's really important um, for reducing animal suffering in general is making the case that animals matter. And uh, even if, you know, just take the example of factory farming, even if AI um, did not change factory farming for the worse, uh, and perhaps was not even used in factory farming, there is an enormous moral problem, I think, with factory farming, and we need to change attitudes about that. So I, I think we're in agreement on that point. Thanks, yeah. Um, maybe this is following a bit from this discussion about, uh, you know, the, the problem that maybe a lot of folks don't care deeply enough about animal interests and animal rights. But I wanted to think about the, the, that problem and how it relates to other issues in AI ethics, and particularly this question of alignment. In the literature, there's a lot of this question, should we be designing AIs to align with human values in some sense? But as you pointed out, and I think in the article you have a, a line about, you know, well, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic should we be about general human values, and at least with regard to animals, it looks like, you know, human ethics, the standard social views in most societies, at least those that, you know, looking at the U.S. and others, they, they consume so much meat, so, uh, one of the most unethical practices in human history, right? Maybe we should be quite cynical uh, about, you know, the prospect of, of human values actually improving things. But if that's right, if it turns out there's just this, you know, the human values are just massively missing the mark concerning what matters, who matters, appropriate behavior, then is the project of AI alignment, that we should be aligning in some sense AIs, maybe ChatGPT, maybe others, with current human values, is that actually the whole project premised on a mistake? As premised on the mistake that... Um, the human that values are already fit for purpose, the current <laughs> society's human values. Um, I think that's, that's possible, and obviously those people who are working on the problem of aligning AI with human values, and they're... Uh, are a number of, of um, you know, very good philosophers and uh, others thinking about that issue. Um, it fluctuates between whether they really want to align AI with the right values or whether they want to align AI with the value of preserving human beings. Um, because when you read a, a lot of the discussion is to avoid the doomsday scenario, to avoid the idea that AI is going to turn on us. And um, you know, so to some extent, <coughs> when Nick Bostrom 
wrote that it would be a serious evolutionary mistake to develop something smarter than us. He was thinking from the point of view of human interests. Um, but you could argue that an AI that was smarter than us, and let's assume it's also conscious and capable of having rich and fulfilling lives, uh, you could argue that that actually would be a better outcome even if it did mean the extinction of our species. Um, because then there would be this uh, very large number of uh, highly intelligent uh, beings, conscious beings living rich and fulfilling lives, and um, we shouldn't really regret the fact that uh, we no longer survive as a species. So uh, I think that's the argument sometimes gets a bit muddled as to whether we want to program it with human values because the human values are the right ones or because uh, we, in a, if you like, a species selfish kind of way, are concerned with our own interests. Uh, hi, Professor S uh, Singer. Uh, big fan of your works. I've read uh, quite a few of them. I'm curious to find out your motivation for doing uh, this session and also to be a visiting prof to NUS. I think many of us in the room probably uh, realize that Singaporeans are not the greatest, uh, most involved or most interested in advocacy or in ethics. So, you know, why, why do these talks? Why, why get uh, involved in Singapore rather than maybe in Europe, in America, where people are, you know, care more about these kind of issues? Well, I must say this is, this is a, an objection to coming to Singapore that um, I've not heard of previously. Um, <laughs> I'm not aware that Singaporeans are less concerned with ethics. Um, actually, Julie and I and, and my wife are in the room had a very n nice experience with Singaporeans when we were somewhat lost and hiking uh, um, over the weekend and um, the people and, and we didn't have phone, phone reception and um, the, a group of three Singaporeans um, helped us to call a taxi and get us out of this hole that we had got ourselves into. Um, so, I, you know, I think they behaved very ethically. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I think there's lots... Look, you know, I don't know Singapore as well as I'm sure you all do, um, but I find um, lots of things to admire about, about Singapore. I think it's... Um, place where uh, things seem to be generally managed in a way that includes most people in society, perhaps not all. I'm aware there's problems with some of your, your immigrant labourers, but I think in terms of providing for the well-being of Singaporeans, at least, um, this country does that a lot better than the United States provides for the well-being of everyone in the United States. So I would regard that as, as a sign of um, a level of, of ethics that uh, is, is not a, a reason for avoiding being present in Singapore. And, and I have to say, I'm, I'm interested in, in, you know, after spending a lot of time in um, the United States and Australia and some time in England, I'm interested in seeing how uh, a, a different society works and um, the kind of ethical ethics that uh, is prevalent there. Hello. Uh, uh, hi, I'm actually quite curious about your opinion about uh, the moral status of conscious AI, um, the rights that it may have. Uh, can you share with us about your opinions? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think uh, there's an, it's an interesting topic to say if we do develop conscious AI, um, and I think that's a possibility that we cannot exclude, although how far away it is, is, is clearly controversial. Um, I think it's probably quite some time away. Um, but if we do get conscious AI and we uh, are confident that it is conscious, or at least there's a reasonable chance that it's conscious, then I think it, um, at a minimum, has the status of non-human animals. So if it's capable of suffering, its suffering will matter. And if it's capable of enjoying experiences, then enjoying those experiences will matter. Um, and if it's as intelligent as us and as capable of having rich and fulfilling lives as we are and as capable of having uh, miserable lives as we are, then it will count just as much as us. And conceivably, if it's super intelligent, it will count more than us. Um, I don't think we should assume that because it's not human, um, 
it, it can't, can't count. Um, the really difficult question, I think, um, and again, you know, this is not my area, is how are we going to know that it's conscious rather than that it's mimicking consciousness? Uh, because already, you know, chatting with chat uh, GPT, um, you get the sense sometimes that you're talking to a conscious being, but uh, I think if you understand how it is that it's doing what it's doing, it becomes clear that you're not. Um, but you can imagine, um, you can imagine AI which is much more sophisticated and perhaps which tries to convince you that it's a conscious being. And uh, also you can imagine that we're not really clear why it does that, um, that we don't, you know, it's kind of a black box. We don't understand exactly what's going on inside. So um, that will be a really difficult question. And again, of course, there is a parallel there with non-human animals as to where do we draw the line? Um, are bees conscious, for example? It's, it's, it's really hard to say, I think. Thank Excuse you. me, Prof. Uh, Singer. Uh, thank you for your thoughts. I'm here. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, sorry. <laughs> I was just struck by your statement that we sort of draw the line at invertebrates. So my question is, eventually, would we sort of expand our species boundaries to include you know, invertebrates and other organisms? Because you mentioned philosophies like Jainism, they already do that. They sort of don't eat underground tubers because they don't want to harm germs. So, I mean, are we sort of looking to expand boundaries further? Not just, not just cats and dogs, but invertebrates also, and where will it end? Well, obviously not just cats and dogs, but, um, but I, for me, the, the line is to be drawn at um, whether a being is capable of having experiences, that is, has consciousness. Now, um, the consciousness that we're aware of, that we know, comes from having a brain, which consists of a very large number of neurons. Um, and so one issue might be, how many neurons do you need to be conscious? Um, can we, you know, and, and, and we, we do know those things um, about other animals. Um, and for, I, I mentioned bees just then because bees, in terms of insects, seem to have the most or roughly the most neurons, um, about, about a million compared with, what is it in humans, 40 billion or something? Is that, I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's a vastly larger number. But still, you could imagine maybe, and, and they do communicate with these dancers. So it's a little mysterious, but consciousness is possible. But if you get down to... Um, a lower level, if you get down to things that are alive in the sense of germs, but um, not having um, uh, a, bra a brain or a nervous system. You know, even if you get down to an oyster, for example, which has a much more rudimentary system, not really centrally organized with a brain, I think it's very doubtful that an oyster is capable of consciousness. So um, I'm not willing to go as far as, as Jane's might, or indeed you know, those vegetarians and vegans who say, no. Oysters are animals, I'm not going to eat them. Um, that's not my view. It's not a matter of whether you define something as an animal. It's a matter of are there grounds to believe that it is, or at least that there's a significant probability that it is a conscious being. But how do we, suppose they suffer, are they still conscious? Because now people are doing research and saying plants and trees feel pain. So if you cut with an ax, a tree will feel pain and they give some certain different signals. Which, which may not be neurons as we understand it, but these are signals with which they communicate. So there's new research that I just read in some science magazine. So I mean, uh, our knowledge is constantly evolving. So I mean... Well, look, look certainly our knowledge is, is, is increasing. And so what I say is from the present standpoint and the knowledge we have now, and we should be open to new evidence, um, we do know more about trees than we knew when I first published Animal Liberation in 1975. And so if you look at the wording of what I say about plants, it's just slightly more open to the possibility that we may discover that plants have some kind of consciousness. But I still think that's very unlikely. Um, the communication that you talk about is um, the release of chemicals which are detected by other plants and may affect what the other plants do in terms of, say, protecting themselves against uh, an infestation. Um, but it doesn't, 
it doesn't in itself show that there's consciousness or intention. It's not necessarily intentional communication. So um, I'd be looking for, for, for more evidence before that. And after all, um, I think it's reasonable for us to say we need to eat something. Um, and uh, and with, if, if, if we don't, you know... So, sorry, I think we, we've got to move on. Um, I think you were next. Hi, so I have a question that follows up on this question of neuron count. Um, you've argued that uh, animals matter because they suffer, but I'd just like to explore the question whether all animals have the equal capacity to suffer. And William McCaskill uh, raises this question in his most recent book, uh, What We Owe the Future. Uh, I think he is also vegetarian for the same reasons. But he said that if you assume that um, the capacity to suffer is roughly proportional to neuron count, then the, um, the total neuron count of all humans is about 30 times larger than the total neuron count of all factory farmed animals, including fish. And therefore, you could argue that humans have a higher moral status by roughly that factor. Uh, how would you respond to that? I don't think that it... It I don't think that it would follow from the calculation that you mentioned that humans as individuals have a higher moral status than animals. Um, because by moral status, <coughs> I mean um, what consideration should we give to a given quantity of suffering, right? Um, so the principle that I defend in Animal Liberation and Animal Liberation Now is a principle of equal consideration of interests and that acknowledges that the interests may differ so it's not equal consideration of whatever suffering a being is capable of um, which would be a problem uh, given what you said but it's saying that if a being with far fewer neurons is capable of suffering to some degree then that suffering is as significant ethically as a similar amount of suffering that you or I might experience. So um, if you can show in a particular case that a human will suffer more than uh, a factory farmed animal, let's say, or just any animal, um, <coughs> then, um, and, and you can stop the suffering but only of one of them, then you ought to stop the suffering of the human. Um, and that's not a violation of the principle of equal consideration of interests because the interests are different and the interest of the human is greater in these circumstances. I would still regard that as giving equal moral status because you're saying there's equal significance in every case of suffering. And sometimes the human suffering might be less, even if the neurons are fewer. It might be that what we're doing to those chickens is so bad for them um, that uh, it outweighs the desire that we have to eat chickens. I would believe that to be the case, or that if you like, the additional pleasure that we may get from eating chickens rather than from eating tofu or some other equivalent item. So, um, so that's why I would see that. Now, you know, if McCaskill is right about what he says, um, then if you had to choose between the survival of all humans and the survival of all factory farmed animals, assuming that they wouldn't be factory farmed, because actually I think <coughs> if, if they're continuing to be factory farmed, that's actually a net negative. Um, but if you're thinking that you know, that number of animals could be outweighed by a much smaller number of humans. Um, well, it could be, yeah. I think that's compatible with my view. I think you're next. Right, uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Singer, for the talk. My question sort of relates to the previous question that has been asked, and that really is, if artificial intelligence could determine the degree of suffering experienced by any sentient being, would this be something desirable would we want to know, like, would we want to be able to quantify the degree of suffering for any sentient creature? Uh, yes, I think it would be very helpful if we could quantify the degree of suffering for every sentient creature. Um, it's very difficult to do. There is an organization called uh, Rethink Priorities that has been doing some research in that area, uh, led by uh, philosopher Bob Fisher from uh, Texas, I think he is. Um, and if you want to you know, you know, they're admitting that basically what they're doing are guesses, but they're guesses that relate, for example, to the neuron counts and, and other things. Um, and I think 
we need to know this because we need to know what our priorities are, even among animals, right? And, and Will McCaskill would certainly agree with this, <coughs> that it's bad that animals are suffering. Um, but let's say we have, as I said, you know, 120 billion fish in aquaculture and 70 billion chickens, and I don't know what the number of billion pigs being factory farmed is, but let's say it's 10 billion. Um, what should our priority be? You know, these are all different beings. Um, how do we decide? Should we campaign against what we're doing to chickens or what we're doing to fish or what we're doing to pigs? Um, that's an, a, a really a, a baffling question. We can you know, try to do a bit of all, or we can let people go what they prefer with. But really, if we, wanted, if we could know how much each of these beings can suffer, we would have a better idea of what our um, advocacy priorities for change uh, ought to be. I think the lady um, in the middle here. Hi, thank you. So I wonder what you think about the following scenario. Um, so as you said, our desire to eat chicken might not be as strong as the desire that the chicken has of not being tortured. Um, and on the other hand, we can eat other things that um, probably suffer less. Um, on top of that, we should eat some things, or even if something uh, suffers, um, even if everything suffers, we should probably go for the thing that suffers less and nourishes the most. So using that principle, I, I wonder what happens if you apply it to the driving case. Um, so k killing invertebrates is not ideal, but as you said, it would be a hassle if we told cars not to run over any uh, of them. But not all rights are created equally, so I wonder what will happen if... So, so if you need to use the car to, to do something important, like um, going to hospital, maybe you should drive over some invertebrates, but if you're using your car to uh, drive around, have some fun, or uh, going to the movie theater, then maybe you shouldn't. And I wonder what you would, how would you resolve, how would you resolve that kind of scenario in which um, we yeah. shouldn't, yeah, the cars can go only if you have a legitimate purpose or things like that. Um, I think I think that, that what you're saying is is right. Um, that it does depend on on the purpose or the need. Um, that complicates the discussion again, of course. Um, but, yes, you could certainly, and I think some people would think that. So, um, <coughs> in Australia, um, we have a lot of, of nocturnal animals. So, if you're driving down rural roads, you're, um, and, and they particularly will come out at, at dusk. So, um, I think a lot of people would, would should say, um, well, I don't need to drive down this road, you know, if I do drive uh, to get there, I would I would drive fast. So I probably, if there's a uh, a kangaroo or a wallaby out on the road or a wombat or something like that, I wouldn't be able to stop. So it would be better that I carry out the journey during daylight when there's less likely to be animals on the road. Um, and it's only if, as you say, you know, someone in my household is sick needs to be taken to hospital urgently, then of course you would say, well, okay, that's important enough. I will drive, even though there's a risk that I will um, hit and kill or injure an animal. So uh, taking, taking the, the reason for the journey into account is, is important. Um, and maybe it's a reason why some journeys we ought not to make at all if we know that there's a risk of, of uh, hitting and injuring or killing uh, uh, an animal on the road. I think we can take one more question. Yep, just here. Kelvin, is the food all right? At the uh, end of Reasons and Persons, Derek Parfit has this famous passage where he says, secular ethics is, is a young enterprise and you know, it's only recently been started by humans and maybe we're going to make a lot of progress and we shouldn't be so cynical about the lack of moral disagreement. To what extent do you share his optimism about ethics in human society or to what extent do you, do you favour the cynical view that others have about there's just so much disagreement amongst people and uh, hu humanity is just going to be full of this contention and disagreement on all these key ethical issues. We're not going to make that much progress. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a good question to end on as it was a good point for Parfit to end reasons and persons on. 
Um, I, th I think that you know, the, the, the people, a lot of the people who are concerned about the distant future, like Will McCaskill in, in What We Owe the Future, um, argue that if we can survive the next century or two, um, then our species is likely to survive for a very long time because it will be able to colonise other planets and even if there's some disaster on this planet, um, we will be able to survive and eventually uh, repopulate this planet too. Um, and I would say, you know, that's a hypothetical, but yes, the future, you know, we are at only at the beginning of thinking about secular ethics. And I think there has been, I, I wrote a book called The Expanding Circle, which talks about the expanding sphere of, of moral concern. So I think looking at it for, in the very long term, there has been moral progress. Um, and I would hope that that will continue um, if we survive. But that's not a given, and especially the things we're doing to the planet in terms of climate change, uh, the risks that we're creating of global pandemics, which I've already mentioned, the risk of nuclear war, which um, seemed very low maybe 10 years ago, but seems to be somewhat higher today. Um, so there are a lot of hazards, and that means that I can't really be um, entirely optimistic or confident about the fact that we will have centuries or millennia to develop ethics. But uh, I think Parfit's right that we've only been developing secular ethics for a short time and the future is, is open. He has that wonderful quote from Nietzsche about uh, an open sea beckoning. I don't remember the exact wording of it, but it's, it's a great vision which, which he applies uh, to the present. Thank okay, you. that's um, a brilliant uh, point to end. I must say I've been converted. I was initially sceptical uh, when, when I, I heard that this was going to be a talk about uh, why AI ethics should consider animals. And I, like the first questioner, wondered why this was any different to whether computer ethics or gene ethics or environmental ethics should consider animals. Um, but it was a wonderfully rich talk, autonomous vehicles, um, the privacy of orcas, I won't look at crabs and frogs crossing the road in the same way again. Uh, and, and I am, though, slightly worried that the, the catering uh, includes meat in, uh, or, or AI, in which case I suggest you don't eat it. Um, so please join me in thanking Peter for a, a really rich and wide-ranging talk.